Hey everybody, this is Dr. Guffey and this is a video walkthrough of Chapter 9, Crimes Against Persons. These are other offenses than homicide. So what I'm going to do in this video is essentially walk you through my lecture notes. That should be useful to you as um, we're making this transition over to remote learning. So um, watch the video, take some notes, read the chapter. You have free access through McGraw-Hill. And um, there's a quiz at the end of chapter nine I need you to, to take and complete by the deadline. Um, and we're gonna get through this just fine. So let me go ahead and dive in. This is the only slide you're going to see. This is just me talking through it, okay? So the thing to keep in mind, we're gonna cover in this chapter a host of crimes. Physical crimes, that includes assault and battery and robbery. We're going to talk about sex crimes, crimes against a person in the home, that includes uh, various types of abuse, false imprisonment, and also kidnapping. So starting off with battery, the thing to keep in mind, battery involves touch, okay? I'm, I'm hitting my fist against my palm as I tell you about this. Battery involves actual touching, and there are three elements here. The actor's conduct in touching or applying force to the victim, the actor's mental state. Usually there is an intent to injure. There's criminal negligence. There might be committing an unlawful act that involves the touching or application of force, and also there has to be some kind of harm done to the victim by the touching. That can be a very slight harm, but there has to be a, a harm. We often smush assault and battery together, and they're two separate crimes. So in your textbook, you're looking at 242 and 243, because the elements of assault are different. Assault is not the actual touching. It's either the attempt to cause a battery, or it's conduct that is threatening or designed to frighten the victim. That is key, okay? That's really key to understanding the difference between assault and battery. Keep in mind, frightening the victim, we're looking at what would cause an average person to be afraid. If you are in a haunted house for Halloween and somebody jumps out and scares you, that's not an assault. You kind of signed up for that when you went into the haunted house. But if you have the very same thing happen in a different context, say you're walking home and someone jumps out of the bushes, that actually could be an assault. The chapter also talks about something called mayhem. This is assault with intent to maim. Look at page 245. This is an intent to maim or disfigure a person. And it involves the infliction of specified injuries such as dismemberment, disablement, disfigurement. Mayhem is a very, very old crime, and in most jurisdictions, it's being taken off the books and replaced with things that are more specific. Keep in mind, assault and battery are different from mayhem. Mayhem has a specific intent to maim or disfigure. And again, this has been eliminated under the model penal code. It's usually folded in with aggravated assault. Keep in mind there's a difference between aggravated assault and battery and simple assault and battery. Page-wise, we're at 23 to 245. Aggravate is much more serious. It's a specific intent crime. Conduct that is accompanied by intent to kill or rape is the most common definition. Simple assault and battery is general in intent. You mean to cause the offensive touching but you don't have the intent to kill the person or rape the person. Aggravated is much, much more serious. From there, the chapter discusses robbery. Uh, keep in mind, this is different from other forms of theft like larceny. Look at page 247. The essential elements here are, one, the taking of property, two, from a person, three, with the intent to deprive the owner of the property, and four, by the use of force, fear, or intimidation. Really important to understand the difference between um, robbery and something like larceny. 
Uh, let's see, from there, let's go into the next section, which deals with sex crimes, elements of rape. This is about page 250. Under the old definition, this was gender specific, and it was sexual intercourse by a male defendant with a female victim that is committed by force, means of deception, which would be specified in the statute, or while the victim is asleep or unconscious, and under circumstances where the victim is not competent to give consent due to mental disability, due to age, or due to some kind of in intoxicating agent like drugs. The gender specificity of it is, at least in most states, has been removed. Uh, it is, of course, possible for a woman to rape a man. It is possible for a woman to rape a woman. It is possible for a man to rape a man. Things that under the old law, or, or the old laws, were not uh, considered. Keep in mind, rape is a general intent crime. Um, the defendant doesn't have to have the specific intent to have non-consensual sex. Um, if the defendant has a what's called a reasonable and genuine belief that the victim gave consent, it's not rape. And this, of course, causes huge problems with the law because you get into, well, I thought. Uh, page 251 will help with that. From there, they get into statutory rape. They get into spousal rape. Keep in mind, spousal rape is a recent development in the law. Uh, North Carolina was actually the last state to criminalize the rape of your spouse. And in many jurisdictions, force is still a required element. Um, again, the law moves slowly, I'm afraid. Statutory rape, keep in mind, is sexual contact with or without consent between an adult and a minor. Um, and again, it, it doesn't matter if there's consent. They're underage. They legally cannot give consent. The book discusses something called Megan's Law. This required community notification when a convicted sex offender moves into that community. It started in New Jersey back in the mid-90s. It's now in force in all 50 states and all territories. This is a dark chapter, folks, because now we move from that into things like child abuse, spousal abuse, elder abuse. This is uh, begins on page 255, goes through about 263. Keep in mind there's a difference between child abuse and child neglect, so keep an eye on that. Um, abuse is more intentional, obviously, and it encompasses everything from physical or sexual abuse to also emotional maltreatment. Most child molestation, unfortunately, goes unreported. There's a desire to protect the molester, who is often a family member or a close friend. The child feels guilty. They're afraid of being punished because they've been told by the molester that they will be. And um, particularly with very young children, there is a difficulty in actually expressing what has occurred. There are heightened responsibilities for parents and guardians when it comes to child abuse. The law simply views parents and guardians as having an inherently higher responsibility to, toward a child. Elder abuse is just awful. Usually occurs in the home, and it's abuse, neglect, or often financial exploitation of the elderly. The last dark thing we talk about in this chapter is false imprisonment and kidnapping. Keep in mind, there's a difference here. False imprisonment is unlawfully restraining a person. You're interfering with their liberty, and you have the specific intent to restrain that person. Kidnapping, on the other hand, is the forcible movement of a person from one place or another, or confining that victim secretly. It doesn't require much movement. Ransom is not a requirement for a crime to be kidnapping. It often is part of it, but it's not a requirement. Um, there is something called the shopkeeper's rule. 
involving a store owner and when they can restrain a person if there is a reasonable belief that a customer has not paid a bill or has shoplifted an item. You can't restrain somebody unreasonably. You have to look at circumstances in time and you cannot use physical force. That's around page 265. That is a quick walkthrough of this chapter. Obviously, there is more to it. You need to read the chapter. There are a couple of cases in particular that are well worth taking a look at. Um, and those are, those are laid out on the first page of chapter nine. But there, there are some, some cases here I would suggest you take a look at. Look at the application cases. There are five of them, one in each, uh, one under physical crimes, that is People v. Keenan. There are two under the sex crimes section, two under um, crimes against person in the home, including State v. Williams, and in false imprisonment and kidnapping. There is a application case there in the matter of the well